fist the dagger. G'day guys, JB here. Episode 8 of Legends Profile coming out to you right now. And we've been through some really different characters throughout Legends Profile. Over the season, of course, we started back with the late, great Dennis Johnson, famous for his time in Seattle, Phoenix, and of course, the Boston Celtics. We had another Boston Celtic after that, the great Kevin McHale, one of the most fundamentally sound power forwards of all time. We then moved on to a more uh, eccentric power forward, one of the best defenders of all time, Dennis Rodman. Moved forward with another piston great in Ben Wallace. Followed that up with Dwight Howard, and we've gone back in the time machine a little bit over the last couple of episodes as well. Pitching Paul Arizon, one of the first great scorers and stars of the league back in the 1950s for Philadelphia. And, of course, a guy who also had the name of Mr. Clutch, Sam Jones, the shooting guard, sharp shooter for that famous Boston Celtics team. This week, as you can see on the screen, going through some of the uh, more defensive style uh, players from back in the day. Once again, we're going with one of the most unsung centres in league history, the late, great Nate Thurmond, a genuine Goliath of a man, a guy that looked like a Greek god, albeit for the uh, the hairstyle and the receding hairline, but built like a Greek god, played like a Greek god, rebounded as well as any player to have ever played the game, and probably the most underrated defender in the history of the league. You've only got to hear some of the stories of the greats who played back during Nate's era to hear of just how good of a player he well and truly was. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Let's get into another episode of Legends Profile, and let's look back at the late, great, Nate the Great, Nate Thurman. A giant of the game and an underrated player from his generation, let's look at the resume and statistics of the late Nate Thurman. It was a two-time All-Defensive First Team selection, a three-time All-Defensive Second Team selection, a seven-time All-Star selection, and an All-Rookie First Team selection. He finished top 10 in MVP voting five times and was a one-time runner-up MVP winner. Now, before I go on with Nate Thurman's statistics, it must be remembered that he did not play with a three-point line. There are no turnover statistics and he only played a limited amount of time with known defensive data. So with that in mind, he played 964 regular season games, averaging 37.2 minutes per game. He averaged 15 points, 15 rebounds, 2.7 assists, 0.5 steals, and 2.1 blocks a game. He shot 42.1% from the field and 66.7% from the free throw line. He played 81 playoff games, averaging 35.5 minutes per game. He averaged 11.9 points, 13.6 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 0.4 steals, and 1.9 blocks a game. He shot 41.6% from the field, and 62.1% from the free throw line. In the NBA Finals, he played 11 games, averaging 44 minutes per game. He averaged 12.8 points, 20.5 rebounds, and 2.4 assists. He shot 33.8% from the field, and 67.2% from the free throw line. There has been a plethora of centers in NBA history that have garnered the recognition they deserve as great defenders. Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, Willis Reed, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Dave Cowens, Bill Walton, Mark Eaton, Manute Bowl, Hakeem Olajuwon, Patrick Ewing, David Robinson, Dikembe Mutombo, Alonzo Mourning, Ben Wallace, Marcus Camby, Dwight Howard, Rudy Gobert. These players are regularly brought up in the conversation about the changes in the way big men defend the floor, as well as how each player brought a different dynamic as a defensive anchor for their teams. But one name is missing. A man who was overshadowed by the greatest defender the game has seen. A man who was a dominant force at the rim and on the glass. That man? Nate Thurman. Thurman nowadays is often used as a meme of a man who had a well-receded hairline in his mid-twenties in an era that most modern fans simply discount entirely. But the man they called Nate the Great was far from a meme. Built like a Greek god, 
His play was legendary in an era stacked with some of the league's most legendary figures. Of every player in NBA history to record at least 10,000 points and 10,000 rebounds, Thurmond is one of just six players, along with Bill Russell, Wes Unseld, Dikembe Mutombo, Paul Silas and Bill Bridges, to record more rebounds than points. No surprise to see that all six men were defensive-minded centres. Thurmond sits 11th all-time in career rebounds, 5th in career rebounds per game and 10th in playoff rebounds per game. Thurmond is just one of five players in history, along with Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Bob Pettit and Jerry Lucas, to average 20 rebounds a game for a single season, a feat he accomplished twice. He, along with Chamberlain, Lucas and Pettit, are the only four players to ever average 20 points and 20 rebounds a game in a season. It's pretty easy to see that Thurmond was, and still, is one of the greatest rebounders the game has seen. During his career span from 1963-64 to 1966-67, Thurman ranked second in total rebounds, sixth in rebounds per game, eighth in blocks, fourth in defensive win shares, and ninth in defensive rating among players to have played at least 500 games during this time. Whether it's on a historical scale or in his own era, Thurman measures up as well as any great defensive big. Nate Thurman was drafted third overall in the 1963 draft and proved to be the clear-cut best player from what was a lowly class. With only four players, Thurman, Gus Johnson, Jim King and Eddie Miles, playing more than 500 games, all of whom were an all-star at least once in their career, Thurman stood out like a sore thumb compared to his peers as his career progressed. However, the rookie class of 1963-64 did feature a more notable name that he would compete with for the better part of his career. Jerry Lucas. Lucas would be crowned Rookie of the Year ahead of Thurmond and Johnson, however it would be Thurmond who was presented with the ultimate achievement in his first season. Limited minutes saw him average 7 points and 10.4 rebounds a game, but the 22-year-old found himself as a reserve to the legendary Wilt Chamberlain, who averaged a staggering 46.1 minutes per game, while averaging a rounded 37 points, 22 rebounds and 5 assists. Thurmond did show glimpses in those minutes across the season of what was to come, with 20 of his 23 games playing at 30 minutes, saw double-digit efforts on the glass in the regular season, and all six games in the playoffs. This saw his production raise in the playoffs and finals, however it wasn't enough as that Celtic team continued on their merry way. His sophomore season would see Thurmond elevate to all-star status, earning the first of four straight selections and seven overall for his career. Assuming the starting centre role for the Warriors after the trade of Wilt Chamberlain back to the East Coast, Nate's numbers immediately grew to 16.5 points and 18.1 rebounds a game. This would begin a run of five straight years averaging at least 18 rebounds a game and some monumental single game efforts. 1964-65 saw him with three games of at least 30 points and 25 rebounds, including a 30.32 effort against Walt Bellamy and Baltimore. 1965-66 saw him with four games of at least 30 rebounds with an 18.42 rebound effort against Dave DeBuscher in Detroit. 1966-67 saw him with three games of at least 30 rebounds, including a 23.37 rebound game against Jerry West, Elgin Baylor and the Lakers. 1967-68 saw him with two games of at least 30 rebounds and a triple-double of 16 points, 28 rebounds and 10 assists against Dave DeBuscher in Detroit. 1968-69 saw him with three games of at least 30 rebounds, including a 35-point, 34-rebound game against Billy Cunningham in Philadelphia. From a team standpoint, the Warriors had to rebuild what they had built. From NBA finalists in 1964, the team would finish 17-63 and at the end of 1965. For some comparison, only the Chicago Bulls from 1998 to 1999 saw a greater drop-off in team record following an appearance in the NBA Finals. While their defensive presence was still a force thanks to the monolith that was Thurmond, their offense suffered greatly with the departure of Will Chamberlain. This issue would find a fix the following season when one of the greatest small forwards the game has seen, Rick Barry, joined the team. With Hall of Fame point guard Guy Rogers running the offense and Warriors legends Al Adels and Tom Mercery, San Francisco began to return to the top of the West. 1965-66 saw Thurmond again average at least 16 points and 18 rebounds a game, but was also the start of a four-year run through to the end of 1968-69, which saw Thurmond average 19 points and 20 rebounds a game. For some perspective on this, the only person to average at least 19 points and 20 rebounds a game 
for at least four seasons is Will Chamberlain. 1966-67 saw Thurman post the first of two consecutive seasons, averaging 20 rebounds per game. His efforts this year in helping lead San Francisco back to the NBA Finals saw him finish runner-up MVP to Will Chamberlain and serve as the true coming out party for him as one of the three best big men in the game alongside of Chamberlain and Bill Russell. With Rick Barry alongside him, setting a scoring record in a 16-foot wide lane, a record that stood for 20 years, San Francisco surged into the postseason. Sweeping the Lakers, Thurman averaged a rounded 19 points and 22 rebounds, including two games of 20 and 20 to close the series. In the conference finals, the Warriors disposed of St. Louis in six games, as Thurman averaged a rounded 16 points and 20 rebounds, with just one game under 20 rebounds for the series. The finals saw Thurman match up against his former teammate Chamberlain in what was arguably the greatest single season by a player of all time. Chamberlain was in the middle of what would be three straight MVP seasons and leading, at the time, the greatest single season team in history. The 76ers would defeat the Warriors in six games as Chamberlain was judged to be the player of the series. Rick Barry would average over 40 points a game, while Thurman delivered a rounded 14 points and 27 rebounds a game, including 24 points and 31 rebounds to open the series. Thurman followed up his last finals appearance with a 20 point, 20 rebound season in 1967-68 and kept the Warriors in the playoffs until the end of the decade. His last three playoff appearances with the Warriors came in the early part of the 1970s, leading the Warriors to back-to-back first round exits against a young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar before losing out to the Lakers in the conference finals in what was Wilt Chamberlain and Jerry West's last full seasons in the league. Thurman's last season in Golden State was to be the first season in which steals and blocks were recorded. His average of 2.9 blocks a game at the age of 32 makes him one of just eight players to achieve this alongside of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Hakeem Olajuwon, Kembe Mutombo, Marcus Camby, Mark Eaton, George Johnson and Larry Nance Sr. Missing the playoffs, Thurman would be headed to Chicago the next season where his most famous game took place. In his debut game against Atlanta, Thurman recorded the first official quadruple double in NBA history. 22 points, 14 rebounds, 13 assists and 12 blocks in a 5 point win. Thurman's court time slowly lapsed throughout the season, relegated to the second unit by season's end as Golden State defeated Chicago to advance to the NBA Finals and become eventual champions. A mid-season trade in 1975-76 saw Thurman head to Cleveland to finish his career, helping the Cavaliers to the Conference Finals against Boston that season, before losing out to the Washington Bullets the following year. With his number retired in both Golden State and Cleveland, his enshrinement into the Naismith Hall of Fame in 1985, and selection to the NBA's 50th and 75th anniversary teams, the legend and legacy of Nate Thurmond is one that, much like his physical stature, is carved out in stone.